is Awake by Tycho. It's one of my favorite pieces of music. Every time I listen to it, my heart rate picks up and I feel confident and overwhelmingly positive. Sometimes I put this on repeat just so I can feel these emotions and steady my nerves when I'm anxious before an important presentation or meeting. In fact, I have to admit, I heard this nine times before I got to the stage this morning. We all have different tastes in music and we all have songs we associate with different experiences, like the loss of a loved one, a holiday tradition, or the high of finally reaching a goal. We may only be aware of music's effect on our mood and emotions, but music also engages other parts of our brain. And music affects our physiology and our behavior at a much deeper level. You may have heard theories of how listening to classical music, Mozart in particular, can make you more intelligent. Unfortunately, the findings from these early investigations on the effects of music were overinterpreted. They have since been discredited by numerous studies. However, studies show that music can affect your behaviors and your decisions in subtle and sneaky ways. For instance, it turns out that the background music playing in a restaurant can affect whether you enjoy your meal. When you like the music, your food tends to taste better. And when you're in the store shopping for a bottle of wine, pay attention to what's playing over the speakers. If it's classical music, you're likely to buy more expensive wine than you would if you were hearing pop music. Music can also impact the quality of our social interactions. Some research suggests that listening to happy and upbeat music at work can make you a more empathetic and cooperative colleague. So what is it that makes music so powerful? And if we could figure it out, could we harness music's effect, music's power, to improve our health and our well-being? Over the past two decades, Cognitive neuroscientists have been intrigued by this connection between music and the mind. They've been exploring many fascinating questions, such as what happens in the brain when we listen to or make music, and how music interacts with the rest of our physiology. They've conducted extensive experiments where they play people music and scan their brains in real time as they listen to these tunes. And what these studies show is that music activates more than just the auditory cortex of our brain. In fact, music stimulates many neural processes, more than any other stimulus. Music activates primitive reward centers of the brain, centers that are associated with things like food and sex and other biologically important behaviors that are essential for survival. It stimulates these centers to release dopamine, and that produces feelings of intense pleasure and motivates us to repeat these behaviors. Is the same dopamine rush that's part of what makes you reach out for a delicious piece of chocolate cake over and over. Interestingly enough, psychostimulants and drugs such as cocaine or nicotine activate the same circuitry in the brain, which raises the question, could music be used to manage addiction? Music does more than stimulate just the pleasure centers of the brain. It activates regions related to empathy and social affiliation, memory and attention. It even has a tremendous effect on stress and pain regulation. It engages the motor and activity regions of the brain, the same regions that are active when you pick up an object or take a step. It's the automatic engagement of these motor areas that gets us snapping our fingers or tapping our toes when we hear music. Now, because music engages the motor areas so effectively, scientists believe that it can be used as a treatment for movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease. Patients with Parkinson's disease have trouble both initiating and coordinating movement. They tend to freeze when they try to walk, and they typically take short steps, like a shuffle, with a very unsteady gait 
that increases the risk of falling. Researchers, such as Colorado State University's Michael Thott, as well as other groups around the world, have conducted over two dozen studies exploring the relationship between music and gait. What they found is that providing patients with an external auditory cue as they walk, cues with a rhythmic cadence, such as a metronome or a marching song, can lead to significant improvements in their gait. Patients tend to walk faster, they take longer steps, and they even demonstrate better posture and improve limb coordination and balance. Now, we don't yet know how durable these effects are after treatment. We don't know which patients stand to benefit the most. But we do know that therapists are already using some of these findings in rehabilitation settings. And they are seeing promising results, at least in some patients in the early stages of the disease. So music can help with physical rehabilitation. But what about pain management? These days, when we feel pain, we typically go straight to the medicine cabinet. In most cases, medicines and pharmaceuticals are very effective. But we are in the middle of a grave opioid epidemic, at least here in the United States. Since 1999, the number of opioid-related opioid deaths have quadrupled, and over 165,000 people have died from a prescription-related overdose. Despite this, the number of prescriptions have continued to increase. But according to a 2014 report, Americans are not feeling any less pain. But what if some patients could substitute music for morphine? Studies show that listening to music in hospital settings reduces anxiety. Patients are calmer during procedures and they even request less pain medication post-operation. In one study conducted in a group of patients undergoing hernia surgery, patients who listened to music for one hour, just one hour post-operation, required on average a third of the pain medication compared to patients who didn't listen to music. So really, all of us should have the opportunity or even the right to listen to music when we're in the hospital during or after surgery. The benefits of music for pain have also been seen in a few studies for chronic pain, during labor, or even in dental settings. So pick your dentist not just on the quality of the root canals, pay attention to the selection of office playlists. These are just a few examples of how music can be used to treat disease or provide therapeutics in clinical settings. But it doesn't end here. These studies and documented cases of music improving depression and anxiety and PTSD. Music can enable speech and motor recovery after stroke. It can help with learning and developmental delays. And anecdotally, music can even lead to the revival of autobiographical memories in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So music has all these positive effects. Would just any song work to make you feel more relaxed, boost your mental alertness, or reduce your fatigue or depression? Robin Sartori at McGill University has imaged the brains of people as they experience chills, which are indicators of a heightened emotional response, as they listen to some of their favorite music. He then had the participants undergo a second imaging session. But this time, they exchanged the music, so each person heard someone else's favorite tune. What his study showed was that one person's favorite music does absolutely nothing for someone else. The conclusion is that our relationship with music we love is uniquely personal. This personal emotional association drives many of our physiological responses. So next time you're wondering why a song that your spouse or your children or even the whole world seems to enjoy. It just doesn't appeal to you. Science is your back on this. The structure of the music also is important to how our bodies respond. Music with a strong tempo increases our heart rate. Music with a distinct rhythm that matches our pace makes us feel less fatigued as we exercise. 
and a series of sequential crescendos will synchronize our blood flow and our respiration. It's possible that other features, like the pitch, the modality, the tone of the instruments, all interact in complex ways to affect how we perceive and react to music. What I've shared with you today are just some of the ways music can be brought into mainstream medicine. The exciting part is that we've only just begun discovering the health effects of music. We could find ourselves in a world where we understand the medical impact of music so well that each of us can identify specific music signatures unique to us that are dynamically attuned to our individual and changing physiologies. Think what it could mean to have personalized, science-driven playlists to help with everything from relaxation and sleep, to concentration, to physical pain, or even exercise. We still have a lot to learn. But at this stage, the science suggests that it's not too far-fetched to have a musical medicine, effective as a pill, but without nasty side effects. When the science supports it, we as a society and our healthcare systems could reap tremendous benefits from adopting non-pharmacological modalities as a therapeutic option. And if we are open to this, the day may indeed come when if you're stressed, anxious, or even in physical pain, you could hear your doctor say, take two of these songs and call me in the morning. <laughs>